Hello everyone, this is the second math video on the Foundations of Mathematics 12 in an hour worksheet. Um, right now we're going to go over chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8 questions, uh, starting with chapter 5. Um, so this question looks a lot like the one that we did in class, but what I changed was um, the one that we did in class was about uh, if what's the probability that Logan and his dog will see other dogs. But this time you can notice part B, it says assuming that Logan and his dog will see other dogs, what's the probability that they walk by the river? So that's a different question and involves um, using conditional probability in a different way that we did in class. So um, here we go. But the first part is of course the same because you're just drawing a tree diagram. Now by the way, some of these numbers will look different than the one that's on your worksheet that you're looking at right now. Uh, and that's because um, I did not save a copy that I gave out to the block two people. So um, your numbers may be a little different, but um, the the ideas are the same. So if you are not sure about um, what's happening, just make sure to leave a comment below um, in the YouTube video there. And then I'll um, see if I can um, make, a, make another update video or something uh, just to help people along. So this is about this will be about river and the block and then the second layer of course is dog and no dog so this will be dog no dog dog no dog okay so d d prime d and d prime and then what you're going to do is you're going to fill out the numbers so five out of seven days they are by the river and then two out of seven days they are by the block um 45 percent of the time they'll see other dogs that means um 55% of the time they won't, 40% here, 60% uh, here. Okay, so that's part A. It's pretty straightforward. Now part B, what you're looking for is you're looking for the probability that they are walk by, walking by the river given that they saw a dog. So if you look on the probability formula work um, sheet there, this is actually going to be equal to um, probability of R and D divided by the probability of D. So how do we calculate that? Well, the probability of R and D is actually this right here. So you can take 5 sevenths and multiply by 0 0.45. And what you're going to end up doing is you're going to divide by uh, the probability of D, which is this branch plus this branch. So it's a little bit more involved compared to the question that we did in class. Okay, so this will be 5 sevenths times 0 0.45 plus 2 over 7 times 0 0.4. Okay, so you can actually punch this on your calculator. If you use brackets, um, you can actually do this all at once. So I'm going to show you what that looks like. So 5 over 7 um, times 0 0.45, close bracket, divided by bracket 5 over 7 times 0 0.45 plus 2 over 7 times 0 0.4. So it's going to do that on one go and you're going to get 74%. So uh, this will be 0 0.7377 um, and so forth. And if you round up, this will be just 74%. Okay. And that's it. So um, a bit more involved just because the this is what you would have calculated um, in class for the question that we did do, but um, the situation is kind of in reverse right now, so you have to do a bit more work, but it's, I don't think it's overly challenging, so I fully expect that you'll be able to do this um, on the final exam. Okay, so let's continue to chapter six. Okay, so um, these questions are a lot easier, of course. Um, you just need to be able to kind of sketch a graph of this polynomial function. Remember there's three, three different kinds. There's linear, quadratic, and cubic. Um, and we're going to ask you about some properties here and there. So you can see that this is a negative cubic function. 
and that has a constant of 1, so that would be the y-intercept, of course. So under y-intercept, we can write 1. And because it's negative, it's going to come from quadrant 2 and go into quadrant 4. Um, so it's probably going to do one of these things, something that looks kind of like that. Okay. Um, so you will not be able to figure out exactly what the x-intercepts are, but you can say that there's um, anywhere, so anywhere from 1 up to 3 x-intercepts. Okay. 1, 2, or 3 x-intercepts. So the question will actually say, like, what is the number of x-intercepts? It will not just say, like, x-intercepts. Um, the domain. Now, the domain of any uh, polynomial function is all real numbers, so that's easy. The range. So you can see that this graph will continue to go upwards and downwards, and there's no gaps anywhere, so the range is also all real numbers. The only polynomial function that has a restricted range is the uh, quadratic one. The end behavior, you do need to know about your quadrants 1, 2, 3, and 4. And it always goes from left to right. So this is actually going from quadrant 2 into quadrant 4. Okay, And the number of turning points, there is going to be... Um, to 2, right, um, because you can have a graph that looks like this one. So that does not have any turning points. But you don't know that, so you can just say that number of turning points is up to 2. Okay. Uh, and so there's also the regression question for chapter 6, uh, but Again, you can check with the YouTube video on how to do those questions. Um, it's not going to go over it here because that will take up a lot of time. Um, and it's something that's already online and available to you already. So uh, please do look at those, though, because um, uh, although you'll be given a formula sheet, you, there are some subtleties that you do need to know about. So please do check those videos before you come in and write the final. Okay, let's continue to, on to uh, Chapter 7. Um, this is about the exponential function and the logarithmic function. So uh, right now I'm just going to talk about the logarithmic function. Um, you can check with the um, in the notes for the exponential one. Okay, so the thing about a logarithmic function is the first thing you need to check is the coefficient. It is negative, so it's going to be a negative function. And the base is equal to the exponential e. Okay, so the graph of a logarithmic function that's negative actually looks like this. Oops, that's not it. Something like that. Okay. Where the x-intercept, unless the graph is moved around uh, horizontally or vertically, the x-intercept is equal to is going to equal to 1, there will be no y-intercept. Okay, that's very important because the domain of a logarithmic function that's not moved horizontally is always just x greater than 0. The range is going to be all real numbers because as you can see, this graph will keep on going up forever. It's going to keep on going down forever. And the end behavior, now, it matters if it's increasing or decreasing because this one is decreasing, actually comes from quadrant 1 and goes into quadrant 4. So. Um, it's important for you to be able to make that distinction, and, it has n and it's decreasing, so we already talked about that part. Okay, uh, so there's one more to go, chapter 8. Okay, so chapter 8, um, we're just going to talk about range, period, horizontal translation, and the equation of the midline. First one is the range. Um, it's pretty straightforward. You were just looking for negative 1 and up to 5. And remember, the range refers to the y value, so it should be written as negative 1 less than or equal to y less than or equal to 5. Uh, it has to be less than or equal to. Uh, it's not just less than and greater than, because it includes negative 1 and it includes 5. 
the second part of this is um, you can also figure out what the amplitude is um, if you look at the graph and that's of course is related to the range so if you just look at the graph you can see that the midline is actually right at 2 okay so of course for the equation of midline you can write y is equal to 2 and you can see that the amplitude is going to be 3 So basically, um, the range, um, you can see the range consists of six numbers, and you divide six by two, you get three. That's kind of the idea for that one. The period you can look at in terms of maximum to maximum point, minimum to minimum point, or you can look at how long it takes to complete one cycle. So you can see that one cycle goes down, up, and down again. So that's a span of one and two. So the period must be two. The horizontal translation is a little bit trickier because there's two different versions. If it was a sine graph or a cosine graph, it will be different. So if it was a sine graph, then remember that it starts in the middle and then goes upwards and then comes back down. So where does it do that? Well, it starts doing that right there. So if it was a sine graph, then it would have moved to the right one. However, if it was cosine graph, then it would have started at the maximum and went downwards. And here it started at maximum and went downwards. So if it was a cosine graph, then it would have been left by uh, 0 0.5. So that's the um, difference there. Last part is about a function. I'm going to write both the sine and cosine version. Um, you can see that there's no degrees anywhere. So this is actually in radians. Um, so we'll, the period I'm going to calculate is going to be in terms of radians and everything else is going to be in terms of radians. Okay, so the first function is going to be y equals the amplitude of 3 sine and then the period is going to be 2 pi. Sorry, the period is 2 so therefore b is equal to 2 pi divided by 2 which is just pi. And I have x minus 1 plus 2. For the cosine graph, the amplitude is the same, so 3 cosine, the period is the same, pi. Um, here's the difference, you have x plus 0 0.5 because it moves to the left by half space, and then plus 2. Um, and that's it. So that's how you write a uh, sinusoidal function for a for graph. So that is the end of the Foundations 12 in an hour video, which covers written questions from chapters 1 through to 8. Hopefully this has been a useful study tool for you, um, and I'll see you next time.